All right, let's go into the Word of God tonight in the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. And we are in the sixth chapter of the prophet Isaiah tonight. Amen. Isaiah chapter 6. We will begin reading there at verse 8. Isaiah 6 and verse 8. Isaiah says, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. Amen. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see you indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. Amen. Interesting statement. Amen, amen. Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate. And the Lord have removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. But yet in it shall be a tenth, and it shall return and shall be eaten as a till tree, and as an oak whose substance is in them when they cast their leaves. So the holy city shall be substance thereof. The title of the message tonight, The Holy Seed is the Stump. Amen, amen. The Holy Seed is the Stump. Amen, amen. Let's pray. Father, we come before you right now. We need you tonight. God, that you are anoint us to speak your word tonight to your people. To be able to speak it, to preach it, Lord. That your people be able to hear it and receive it. And understand it. We stand in your presence with awe, Father God, reverence, your holy name and your holy word. Lord Jesus, that we would be the people that you have destined us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. Chapter 1. Beginning with verse 1, we see a very, very short historical record that is given concerning the prophet Isaiah. The Bible says, The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So this prophecy is going to be spoken concerning Judah. It gives us these kings. Four of them are recorded here. Tells us the time of the prophecy of Isaiah. And after this very, very brief historical background for the prophecy, he jumps right into the prophecy. So verse 2, he begins, and he says this, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought, brought up children, and they have rebelled against me now what I'm going to be preaching tonight historically is to Judah and also in the future it's called the day of the Lord the coming day of judgment that will come upon the whole world Amen. so it concerns Judah historically and in the future but also prophet Isaiah covers the world as a whole the nations as a whole which would include the United States of America Amen. Amen. Spiritual application is for the church. Amen. So he begins here his prophecy and he calls the heavens and the earth to be a jury in this trial. What he's doing is he is bringing Judah into a courtroom. And the reason why he's doing that is because the condition of Judah at this time is that they are physically and spiritually in bad shape. 
And the reason why they are in bad shape physically and spiritually is because they have broken the covenant that God made with them. And so this prosecuting attorney, as you would, Isaiah comes, he's representing God, and he begins to preach to Judah. He brings them into the courtroom of Yahweh, the courtroom of the Lord. And in that courtroom, as a prosecuting attorney, he is going to bring an indictment against his people because they have not lived up to or measured up to the covenant that God made with them. So he calls the heavens and the earth to be the jury in this courtroom. Now the heavens and the earth were present when God made the covenant with Israel. So the heavens and the earth knew about the covenant, what it was. And the heavens and the earth also saw how Judah had violated that covenant. Yes, sir. Amen. So that is why Amen. it's called in calling the heavens and the earth uh, here into this courtroom to be the jury against Judah and its sins. Wow. Amen. He begins to talk about the, the problem. What is the problem with Judah? And he's going to give us four different metaphors. The first one he's going to give you is a domesticated animal. The next one he will give you is a sick body. The third one he will give you is a cottage or a hut in the middle of the field. And then he, in verse 21, will call them a harlot. They have become unfaithful to the Lord. They're not acting like God's people. And the problem with Judah is not that they just come short of the glory of God. The problem with Judah is that they are rebelling against God. The problem with Judah is not that they have turned away from God. The problem is they're looking at God and backing away from Him as they look at Him. So it's not just a coming short of God's glory. It is a literal rebellion that is in their heart against God. And they are walking, as they look at Him, they are walking away from Him. They don't want Him. And so God uses the prophet Isaiah very quickly, as you notice, very quickly. The historical account is given, but very quickly He goes into the prophecy. And He brings the, uh, the courtroom scene in, in the picture here. And the jury is brought in summons. And so we have, first of all, what is the problem? In verse 3, he says this. This domesticated animal. He said, Judah is like this domesticated animal. He says, the ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. The first thing he says about this nation is that they are children. He calls them children. Amen. Amen. He said he's nourished them. He's brought them up. But after everything he's done for them as his children, all the care that he's given to them, they have rebelled against their father and broken the covenant. And so he likens these children uh, that have rebelled against him to this domesticated animal. And he says, you know, he said, when you look at the ox, the ox knows its owner and it knows where to get food. You know? You know, domesticated animals are not too smart. Right? Right, right. So God is likening Judah to, to domesticated animals. Uh, the one thing about a domesticated animal, they're not too smart. They don't know a whole lot, but they do know a couple of things. Number one, they know who their owner is. And number two, they know where to get food. And God says Judas behaving and acting worse than a domesticated man. Because they don't even know who they are. They don't know who they belong to. And they don't know where to go to get help when they get in trouble that they created. You know? An animal at least knows who it belongs to. And knows where to go to get, get food, get help. And God says, but Judah's not like that. See, what has happened to them, and so you, you get the practical application, this is what will happen to anybody who rebels against God. And God takes care of us and He nourishes us, but you rebel against God, then what will happen is you will lose your sense of identity. 
you will not know to who you belong to, amen, amen, where amen. you belong, amen, amen. or where to go when you are in trouble that you created for yourself. Wow. That is a horrible condition to find yourself in. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Amen. How many of you know who you belong to today? Yes, How many know where you belong? Amen. Most people don't know where they belong. Amen. Amen. That's why they wander from church to church to church Amen. to church. Amen. They'll go from conference to conference. Same people you see going from one conference to another conference to another conference. They're the same people. They're the same crowd. Yes, and I don't have a problem with conferences, but the same people that go to the, all of these different conferences never change. Amen. So the reason why they go, people jump from church to church and place to place. Amen. Now, if you're going to a church that doesn't preach the truth, if you're going to a church uh, that you're not satisfied with, then God will plant you somewhere. Amen. Amen. And But once He plants you, you need to know who you are, where you belong. And where you get fed. Praise the Lord. Amen. Don't lose because of sin. Your sense of identity. We belong to God. You belong to Jesus Christ. We belong to God. Amen. I know where I belong. I know to who I belong. I haven't lost my sense of identity. But if you get into sin like them in rebellion, that's what will happen to you. Amen. You will lose your sense of identity. You don't know who you are, Amen. who you belong to, Amen. where you belong. Amen. And when you get in trouble, you won't know who to go to to get help. Amen. And that is a sad state that sin will put you in. Amen. You walk with God. You keep a covenant with the Lord. Amen. You'll know to who you belong. Amen. You'll have a sense of identity. You'll know where you belong. And you'll know who to go to when you get in trouble that you created for yourself. Amen. 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 So he said the ox knows his owner and the ass is master's crib. You know the master's crib? It's a trough. So the ass knows, man. You know, it, I don't know if you've ever been on the farm or not. You know, when I was raised, I was raised out west of town. We had animals and chickens and all kinds of, you know, domesticated animals, you know. And I guarantee you, man, when the sun started going down, they know. They start walking to the troughs. Amen. Because they know the time that they're going to get fed. They know where to go to get fed. Praise the Lord. And you didn't have to tell them. Because they have inside of them a knowledge. But Israel is in so bad shape spiritually. They don't know who they belong to. They don't know where they belong. Amen. Amen. And they don't know where to go to get help Amen. in the trouble they created for themselves. Amen. Amen. Sound like the church, doesn't it? Amen. He goes on and says in verse 4, he says, All sinful nation of people laden with iniquity. Now he's going to talk about the second metaphor. is the metaphor of a sick body. A sick body. And this the sick body is going to talk about the reason why it's sick is because it's been wounded in battle. Okay, okay, amen. Amen. The sickness of the body is not like some disease that's come on the body. The sickness of the body right. is that it's been wounded. Okay, amen. amen. And I feel the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Wounded in battle. Yes, and it's laying in the battlefield and it's it's just festering. Mm. The Bible says from the top of their head to the soles of their feet, they're wounded. Wow. Yes. Yes. And there's nobody there wow. to come and heal them. Wow. It's a picture of their physical condition, their spiritual condition, because now they've been overrun by nations, foreign powers in war and in battle. And at this time, we're not really sure. And I say we, everything I study, nobody can figure out exactly what's happening this part of the year. But Judah's been overrun. Their cities are being burned with fire. Battle has broken out. Yes, sir. And you see them out in the battle, out in the fields laid out from the top of their head to the soles of their feet. Wounded. Amen, amen, amen. 
and not being healed. Amen, amen. It's a horrible condition. Amen. When you get wounded in battle because of your sin, Hallelujah. and there's nobody to heal. There are a lot of people in the church today that are wounded yeah. and they're not healed. That's a sad state to be in. So he goes on, he says, all oh, sinful nation of people laid with iniquity. He said, you're just loaded down with sin. He said, you're not, you know, you're not acting like the people of God. You're acting like the world. Amen, amen. Laden with sin, loaded down, man. Not just falling short, but loaded down with sin. Amen. Hallelujah. You see the seed now. Here we see the term again uh, that we read earlier in Isaiah 6. But here he's called the seed of evildoers. Because they turned their back on God. Amen. Children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backwards. See? He didn't say they turn. So they're going away back. It's like this. They're looking at God and backing away from God. Amen, amen. Hallelujah. And that's why he said when they're in battle like this and they're in the field and they've been wounded from head to toe, they're not being healed because they're walking away from the one that can heal them. Going the wrong direction. So the sick body wounded. Verse 5, he goes on and says, Why should you be stricken anymore? He said, You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint. Amen, amen. That's why. See, what God wanted, God wanted them to be healed. God wants me to be healed. He wants you to be healed. But if you forsake God, you know, the condition you find yourself in, worse than a domesticated animal. Amen. And like somebody in the field has been wounded, not healed. Amen. Hallelujah. God wants the healing to take place. Amen. But they are in a state, they are in a condition spiritually and physically where they're not being healed. How is it that they're not healed when the physician is their God? Right, right, amen. Laying in the fields. Verse 6, from the soul of the foot even unto the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. They have not been healed. He explains what he means in verse 7 or 17. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land, strangers devour it in your presence. And it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. He explains what he means by this picture of a wounded body or a sick body. He says your cities are burned with fire. They're laying in the fields wounded. Amen. Cities are desolate. Amen. Overthrown by strangers. The armies have come in. If God judged the nation of Israel for this kind of sin, I assure you, He would judge the United States of America. You don't think at some point that the cities of America, the United States of America, are going to be burned with fire? You don't, you don't believe, do you? Because we're in America. We don't believe this would ever happen to America. That the cities would be burned, on, burned with fire. And that people would be laid in the streets like laid in the battlefields. Not healed. Because of the sin of that city. Because of the sin of this nation. He then talks about the cottage in the middle of the field. What he means by that. In the time of harvest, if you were a harvester, you would go and you would pitch a little little hut, like a tent, in the middle of the field. You would leave your home and and you would live out there in the field, you know. Yes, and uh, in a time of harvest, everybody would be excited. You can imagine, because it's a time of harvest. Yes, amen. 
And everybody's working. And everybody's laboring to bring in the harvest, right? Amen. And they're staying in this little tent, temporary tent, while this harvest is being brought in. It's, it's a great time of celebration. It's a time of excitement. Yes, sir. And then when everybody gets done with the harvest, they leave that little cottage, that little tent, in the middle of the field, and it stays there. It's abandoned. Amen, amen. Amen. God said, that's the way you are. You're like an isolated individual. You're an isolated church. You're an isolated nation. Surrounded by your enemies. They come around you, and there you are. Abandoned and all by yourself. Surrounded by the enemy. So verse 8, he says, The daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city, surrounded by the enemy. Amen. No food coming in. Surrounded by the enemy. This is what sin does to a person. This is what sin does to a nation. This is what sin does to a church. Amen. And what you have to understand is this, is that God does not change His standard. God does not change His standard. God is a holy God. And because He will not change His standard, you and I are required to align ourselves with God. To repent and to get alive with God. If you're waiting on God to get easier exactly. or to change your standard, He's not going to do it. Amen. He calls us to repent. Yes. He calls us to get right. Yes. He calls us to live up to and measure up to the covenant that He has made with us. He wants to bless us. He wants to heal us. He wants to deliver us from our enemies. He wants to be the victory. But there is a covenant That demands certain lifestyle be lived. If you're in a relationship with God and you're in a covenant with God, God says there are stipulations to the covenant. So I require you to live a certain way. It's not just about Jesus being your Savior, it's about Jesus being your Lord. It's about living up to the requirements, the righteous standards and stipulations of God's covenant. And if we don't do that, God is not going to compromise with those stipulations. He calls us, as He called Judah, to turn back to God, to repent, to keep the covenant, to be faithful to the stipulations of that covenant. Say, praise the Lord. The good news is that not everybody in the nation was bad. There was a remnant. Even in these days, as bad as it was, there was a remnant. They were faithful to God. They kept the promises of God. They walked with God. They were faithful to the covenant. They obeyed the Lord, the commandments of God. And God can bless those people. And God can heal those people. And God can deliver those people. Those who persisted in the rebellion. He said, this is the way it is. You're like an athlete. They may say, man, well, you've lost your identity. You're a wounded individual. It's not being healed. And you're an abandoned, isolated cottage in a field. Surrounded by the enemy. Verse 9, he says, except the Lord of hosts had left there. That's a very small remnant. That's that small remnant I was telling you about. Amen. The remnant, those that are left over, and those that remain. Hallelujah. Not everybody that starts is going to finish. 
and what God is going to do through the prophet Isaiah. He's going to show them at times what they used to be. And he's going to say, now this is how you are. And it's not good. He talks about this remnant, this small group of people, those that remain faithful to the Lord. It was small. It wasn't the vast majority. It was a small group. Amen. So he calls them to repentance, verse 10. Well, let me go back up. Verse 9, except the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies. Lord of armies. Yes, sir. Had left unto us a very small remnant. He did it. Amen. We should have been as Sodom and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. Amen. Sodom and Gomorrah where it was completely destroyed by God, His judgment. Wow. Amen. Lot and his family, his two daughters, his wife, escaped the judgment. And the Bible says in the Gospel of Luke, I believe it's chapter 17, Amen. God uses that as a type of the rapture. And he tells you and I to be faithful to the end. Amen. Hallelujah. He says there that God did not judge Sodom and Gomorrah until he got Lot and his wife and his daughters out of that city. And when he got them out, when he took them out, that's when the judgment fell. The wrath of God fell. Yes, amen. Amen. The Gospel of Matthew talks about and gives you a very strong word. And in that word, in relationship to the end times, Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse, signs that precede the second coming of Jesus to this earth. It's called the day of the Lord. He says something very important. He said to everybody that would hear, remember Lord's wife. Don't turn back to Sodom. Don't turn back to your sin. Don't turn back to the world. Don't turn away from God. Remember Lord's wife. Because she turned back and the Bible says she was she turned into a pillar of salt. Her heart was in Sodom. Let us hear the word of God. Amen. But he said, except the Lord of hosts and lest that left us a very small remnant, we would have been like an Sodom and Gomorrah, completely and totally destroyed. You know how that happened, don't you? God's fiery, fire and brimstone came down yes, amen. and hit that city, burned it up with fire. Yes, hallelujah. Amen. And you know the prevailing sin of Sodom and Gomorrah, don't you? Yes, sir. Was homosexuality. Yes, sir. That's why God judged Sodom and Gomorrah. For later on, they would take the word and, and use the word for homosexuality in the Bible. They would take that word. It was called sodomy. Amen. God judged that nation because of the homosexuality that was there. Amen. Two angry angels went into that city and they were so perverted. The men in that city were so perverted they wouldn't have Sexual intercourse with the angels of God. Right, amen. And Lord said, Men don't do that. Right, right, right. Amen. Here, come in here, men. They were going to stay out in the court of Sodom and Gomorrah. Can you imagine what would have happened to them if those angels would have stayed out in the court of Sodom and Gomorrah? They would have been violated by the men of Sodom and Gomorrah. And Lord said, you stay in my house. And I'll let you have my daughters. And you talk about a strange response. To the, he so revered the angels of God. He said, you stay in my house. You, have my, you can have my daughters. Well, it could be, number one, that because those men were so perverted, they had no desire for the opposite sex. Now that's why Allah would say you can have my daughters. They wouldn't want her. Right. Wow. The sin of salt, the sin, of, sin of homosexuality brought the judgment of God Almighty Amen. on Sodom. Amen. And in Isaiah's day, 
There was similar activity taking place in the nation of Israel. It is a picture of what is going on in the United States of America. Yes. Yes. There is only a small percentage of people that are homosexual. But the way they're pushing their, pushing their agenda, it makes it look like more than just a few. I mean, we're, we're, I'm not going to call you old, statistic, old statistics, but last I heard is about 2% of the nation actually practice homosexuality. It may have increased a little bit. But you see, they keep pushing their agenda and want you to think that Want to, want to become the norm of life. It is normal. It's the way. You know, nothing wrong with it. But that will bring the judgments of God Almighty against the nation. In Isaiah's day, that sin that was prevalent in Sodom and Gomorrah was moving in the nation. It was a sin that was practiced by the nations around them. Homosexuality is not irredeemable. First Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, the Bible talks about, and such were some of you which are washed, you're sanctified, you're justified in the name of the Lord and by the Spirit of our God. And the verse before that, and such were some of you, since you were effeminate. That means you were the passive lover in a homosexual relationship. The effeminate is the passive lover in a homosexual relationship. And he goes on and talks about homosexuality. People caught up in that. So it's not irredeemable. irredeemable. God can save them. Amen. And I say today, as your pastor, they're welcome to come in here. I said even homosexual is welcome to come in here because we want to help them be saved and be delivered and be redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And God can forgive them. But I will also say as your pastor, they are not welcome here to come and promote that lifestyle. Right. Right. Same place the Lord. And when time pressure will come on the churches of America by the government, there's already, already efforts in place to take away the tax exempt status of churches who will not accept homosexuality as a viable lifestyle. Persecution's coming. All right. yes. Yes. Amen. Homosexuality is a horrible sin. Yes, sir. Homosexuality takes away the hope of a person. Yes. It, it doesn't bring happiness to a person. I studied it uh, clinically. Amen. Amen. I studied it biblically and clinically. It doesn't satisfy. It doesn't bring happiness. It doesn't bring peace to the life. It brings depression. Amen. Suicidal thoughts. Yes. Amen. Hopelessness. Yes. The life expectancy, according to John MacArthur's message on homosexuality, the life expectancy of a homosexual lifestyle is 39 years of age. The ferocity, the ferocious fire that burns inside of a homosexual individual is so brutal and so full of jealousy and so full of rage that if you have a partner and you break that relationship off, a lot of times people that are murdered and they're bruised all over their bodies, brutally beaten. The first thing the coroner does is to see if this is a homosexual. Wow. Wow. Because that rage and that fire wow. of jealousy that wow. burns in the homosexual person causes them not to just kill sometimes their partners, but to brutally beat them and bruise them. Wow. Homosexual individuals 
There's something that drives them. There's a fire that's in them. It's, a, it's, it's not ordinary. If somebody wants to break away from a relationship that's in a homosexual relationship, that person will hit them, kick them. Brutal. Wow, wow. Yes. Brutal behavior. Yes. I don't have time tonight to preach that message. But that was going on in the nation of Israel. It's going on in our nation. Yes. We need to do everything we can to reach whoever. Yes. Now I need to tell you this homosexuality. What is homosexuality? Homosexuality is a perverse act of sex. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's what it means. It's a perverse act of sex. Yes. Amen. Don't make it more than that. Right. That's what it is. But it will bring the judgments of God upon a nation, upon an individual. You can't condone it. You can't put your approval on it. If any of you here today and you face that with that from your children, you can't condone it. You can't say, oh, mijo. Oh, mijo. You got to take a stand. Bring the judgment of God upon the life a nation and that was going on in Isaiah's day well, inordinate affections Romans says it's because they did not like to retain God in their knowledge God gave them up to vile affections Doing that which is unseemly. Amen. Men with men, women with women. What causes it? The first cause is departing from God. Right. The nation that departs from God will go into those kind of lifestyles according to Romans chapter 1. Amen. Hallelujah. Individual that departs from God. We'll go to those kind of lifestyles. Right, amen. It is a judgment. Our nation today, you need to pray for the United States of America. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Amen. amen. Legalizing Come on now. The, the lifestyle of homosexuality like it's a race. Right. Right. A perverse sexual act is not a race. It's not a race. Yeah. Yeah. Do you give do, do you legislate rights for the rapist? If you don't legislate rights for the rapist or the murderer, why do you legislate rights for a sexual perversion? It's not a race. It's a perverse sexual Hallelujah. But by God's grace and God's mercy, God can save and deliver. Yes. We have a message. We have a message. Dying by AIDS. All manner of sexual disease. They're not happy. So I say that to you, and I spend a little bit of time with that today, because that is an issue for the United States of America. It is not just an issue for the United States of America, it's an issue for the church to face. What are you going to do? If they say, if you don't allow homosexuals to be in your church, to be a part of your church, and have the same rights as every other member in that church, then we'll take away your Tax exempt status. We will never bow. Amen. If I will never bow, and you can never bow, they can keep their tax exempt status. We'll be faithful to God's word. 
I'm not, I'm not trying to. I'm not just. I'm not saying that uh, to be tough or sound tough or whatever or to challenge anybody. But I make a declaration. You have to prepare yourself. We got too many people today that won't prepare themselves. Allowing all kinds of perversity. Amen, amen. Hallelujah. In the home, in the workplace, in the churches. Won't uh -uh. we'll take a stand. Right. Amen. amen. Women rule over them. Mm -hmm. wow. Which means men that act like women. Wow, wow, wow. Wow, wow, amen. Verse 10, hear the word. Of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Yes, amen. Hallelujah. See, he was speaking to the heavens. He was calling the heavens and the earth to be a jury against them because they violated the covenant. Now he speaks not to the heavens and the earth, but now he speaks to the rulers of Sodom. All right, man, amen. He calls Jerusalem Sodom. Wow. Right. Amen. What if I stood up here tonight? And I called you saw. We're living in the days right now. People, <clears throat> not very many people can handle truth. But Isaiah came to preach the word of God to a people. He loved those people. God loved those people. But he had to tell them the truth. You don't love somebody if you don't tell them the truth. Give the Lord a hand up, please. Am I hearing correctly? That God is calling His covenant people Sodom? They're not acting like the church. They're not acting like God's people. How about us? How about you? How about me? How about me? We live, do we live more like the world? Do we live? Come on, somebody. We're really not. At times, we really don't act like the people of God. Say, praise the Lord, church. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Say, hear it. Shema. Shema. Hear it loud. Hear it strong. Hear it. Hear it, you rulers of the United States of America. Hear it, congressmen and congresswomen and senators. Hear it, president, vice president. Hear it. Hear it, church. Hear it, people of God. Strong and loud. The law. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. Hear the law of God. Somebody said, well, this is Old Testament. And they'll say, we're not under the law anymore. Where do you get that? Right, right, right. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. This is still God's word. Amen. It will be God's word all the way to Hear loud. Give ear unto the law of our God. We need to start adjusting our life to the law of God, to the commandments of God. Listen to me. Jesus said this, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Loving God and obeying His commandments are inseparable. You and I can't break the commandments of God and say we love God. It's not possible. If you love me, Jesus said, keep my commandments. Jesus said the lawless, the, the antinomians, 
They will stand before him on judgment day. Right. Say, Lord, Lord. Right. Right. Have we not prophesied in your name? Done many wonderful names in your name? Cast out devils in your name? And he says, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. The word iniquity means lawless ones. Right, amen. Thinking we can be saved without keeping the commandments of God. Without living a holy life. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices? See, he starts talking now about their physical, spiritual condition. But now he said, here's what your worship is like. He said, your worship is rejected by me. Now I want you to understand something, brothers and sisters. It wasn't because there was anything wrong with the sacrifices that they brought. God had commanded those sacrifices to be brought. They weren't bringing the wrong sacrifices. That wasn't the problem. Right, right. It wasn't because they were missing church. They were faithful. They, the Bible said they trampled down his courts. They went to church at the time that they were appointed, the appointed feasts, the festivals, they went to church when they were supposed to go to church. And when they went to church, they brought the right sacrifices. Okay. Right. Amen. But God says to them, away with it. Amen. I don't want your sacrifices. Why, God? It's the same way today. How many people go to church? The appointed days, they go to church. They go to the prayer meetings. They bring the sacrifice, the tithe, and the offering. They go through the motions. They're thankful. They talk about God. They talk about living for the Lord. They talk about going to church. They talk about all these things. But their lifestyle Amen. is full of sin. God said, you can have all of the externals. You can go to church. You can trade his courts. You can bring the right sacrifices. You can have all of these externals. But if your heart's not right with God, if your heart is away from God, if your life is full of sin, if your life is not transformed, he said it's empty. You and I can get to a place to where we're just going through the motions. And we don't have a relationship with Him anymore. And our life is full of sin. Very quickly, when you come to appear before me, who hath required this as your head? To tread my court. See? And they're just so crowded. Churches are full. Train the courts, man. Amen, amen. Bring down no more vain oblations, incense. See, that's a picture of prayer. Hallelujah. See, there's nothing wrong with the sacrifices, there's nothing wrong with the incense they were bringing. Amen. What's the problem? He said, the incense is an abomination to me. The new movement, the Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies. I cannot, he said, away with it. It is iniquity, even a solemn meeting. Wow. Amen. Your new moons, your appointed feasts, my soul hateth. Wow. They are troubling in me. I am weary to bear them. Wow. And when you stretch forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear your hands are full of blood. He said, this is the reason. Nothing wrong with the incense, nothing wrong with the sacrifices, nothing with the, the, the appointments. They kept all the appointments. He said, the problem is, your hands are full of blood. Right. Wow. Your life is full of sin. Your heart isn't right. God said, there needs to be an internal fix. An internal fix. 
You need to be fixed on the inside. You can have all the externals right. But still be a long walking away from God. Your heart not right with God. A life full of sin. Amen. Hallelujah. God wants us to live a transformed life. He wants a life that we're in a relationship with Him. We love God. And I'm not, listen, this applies to apostolic, Pentecostals, it applies to Baptists, like you name it, whatever. It applies to everybody. There are churches today that call themselves Christian. They're full of blood on the hands. There's preachers that stand in the pulpit. Their hands are covered with blood. Murderers of the people of God. Their reputations, amen, amen. all for the dollar, right, all amen. for numbers. Right. How can you destroy a righteous person and claim to be a Christian? What it is today is we have a, a lot of in a lot of churches. We have a, a Christianity without a cross. Christianity without a cross. As long as you're a part of a particular denomination, particular group, yeah. And I'll be a part of that particular denomination of that group. And they will slaughter you. Not everyone, thank God. Amen, amen. A Christianity without a cross. Without a cross. Amen, amen. I saw somebody the other day on the phone who they were trying to destroy their reputation. They're, they're not here today. I said, let me share this with you. This individual that tried to destroy you, you need to understand you cannot destroy an innocent person without destroying yourself. Amen. It's impossible. Amen. Exactly. Amen. Amen. So going to church, go through the motions, claiming to be Christians. Again, the problem here, they had everything right except the heart. Mm -hmm. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So then he turns, he says, okay, now here, I don't want, he said, this is, I don't want this. I don't want all of these outward things. With no inward reality. Right. Come on, Away with that. He doesn't want the outward without the inward reality. So now he says, This is what I want from you. Hallelujah. He said, What I want from you is he says, Washing. Amen. Make you clean. Amen. Thanks, brother. Amen. Hallelujah. Put away the evil of your doings. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. From before my eyes. Amen. Clean your life up. Amen. Clean your house up. Amen. All right. All right. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Put away the evil of your doings. From before my eyes, cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Amen. Clean it up. Amen. Clean it up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Get right with God on the inside. Cease to do evil and learn to do well. Do you understand, brothers and sisters? How, you know how long it took you to learn how to smoke when you were smoking? God forbid anybody in here still does. <laughs> Amen. Or whatever sin it is. Just whatever sin it is. How long did it take you to learn how to tolerate that whiskey? Right. Right. When you first put it to your mouth and you took that drink, you go, oh, oh, oh. And you kept on, and you kept on, and you kept on until you got we could tolerate it. Right. Amen. 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 You had to, to teach yourself to do that. Right. Well, you become a born again believer. Let me explain something. Let me 
explain something to you. Explain. When you become a believer, you got to learn to do well. Praise God. Because you used to live a certain way. Now I've got to learn a different way. Hallelujah. Learn to do well, he said. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fathers. Plead for the widow. See, he's concerned about social injustices. He does care about it. Say so you love God? Mm -hmm. Read it up. Cease mm -hmm. from evil. Learn to do well. God, Put the evil of your doings away from you. Learn to do well. Amen. Seek justice. justice. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Amen. Amen. That's what he wants. Right. Not the external right. form, but the internal realities Amen. of a relationship with God. Say hallelujah. We love people. Amen. Is there a mutual indwelling in your life? Do you make room for other people? Jesus said in John 17, He prayed for unity in the church. And He said, Father, you're in me, and I am in you. A mutual indwelling. And he says, that's what I want for the body. I want for them to be in the body and the body in them. That means he wants you to make yourself available to other people. Are you making yourself available to other brothers and sisters of the church? A mutual indwelling. Unity. Yes, unity. That's another message. Amen. Verse 18. And this is a beautiful message of the prophet Isaiah. Amen. He, starts, he talks about the condition they're in physically, spiritually. They're rejected worship because they come with external form instead of an internal reality. Then he says, but here's the answer. He said, you can be forgiven. Say, you can be forgiven. You can be forgiven. <laughs> yeah, as bad as you are. Yes, 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 yes. Say, as bad as you are. <laughs> See what he do? He's calling us to repentance tonight. But he's offering forgiveness. And so he says, now come to hell. Come now. What an amazing invitation. One of the most amazing invitations from the Word of God. Come now. Let us please them together. Let's sit down. God says, let's sit down. Let's get together and let's talk about it. <clears throat> Come now. What an amazing invitation. Let us reason together, said the Lord. Amen, amen. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red, like crimson, they shall be as wool. He uses a couple of pictures here again of white. Look at white things. Look at your name say white things. There's nothing really wrong with white things. White snow. Hallelujah. White wool. Though your sins be as scarlet, double dipped garments. Not just a white garment that's been dipped in the red tie, but it's been dipped twice. Double dipped sin. Your sins are so deep, they have permeated the very fabric. Impossible to be taken out except by the blood of Jesus Christ. 
He said, your sins are so deep, they're red like crimson. Crimson, they are double dipped to the dye. Permeate the fabric. But though your sins be like red like crimson. Though your sins be scarlet, they shall be as white as though they be red like crimson. They shall be as wool. How is this possible? That God can take a life that's double dipped in sin. That sin is so deep and permeated in the life of that individual. How can God remove that dye out of that fabric and make it completely white and still and white as wool? Only by the blood of Jesus Christ can it happen. Come, let us reason again. Though your sins be as scarlet tin, they shall be as white as snow. They be red like crimson. They shall be as wool. He said, I'm going to turn it white again. By the blood, by the blood, by the blood, by the blood. If you look at red, through red, you see white. Wow. 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 Amen. Though your sins be as scarlet, they be red like crimson, deeply permeating your life. Part of who you are. God says, when my blood comes and I apply that blood, when I see through the red blood, your sins that are red, he says, I see white. I got about five hours to preach to you in about one and a half hours, so I'm going to get with it this morning. But I'm going to tell you what God sees tonight. He don't see you black. He don't see you Hispanic. He don't see you yellow Japanese. He don't see you white or angry. He don't see that. He sees you through his blood. Hallelujah. And when he sees you through the blood, Hallelujah. he sees white. That's right. Give God praise in this place. Brothers and sisters, skin color. What is skin color? But one gene, one genetic, one gene in your genetic genome. How do you say that? Genome? You know? You know? One gene, only one gene. Changes the color. What is that? Hallelujah! When God sees you, yeah, you got sin, but you repent. You're getting cleansed by the blood. Hallelujah! And now He sees you through the blood. I thank God today. When He sees red through His red blood, He sees white. Out of here. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. What an amazing God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He deserves to be praised. He deserves to be worshipped. He can make you whiter than any stone can make. The wool or the snow. Only God can do that. Think about what I've already talked about Israel, the condition of Judah. When God came in their condition, spiritually and physically, said, I, This is what I want to do for you. But listen, we're going to talk about it because you're not willing to be. Verse 19 If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. That's what God wants. Amen. Hallelujah. He wants to bless your life. He wants to bless my life. He want, are y'all here with me? He wants to give you abundance. He wants you to flourish. He said, you'll eat the good of the land. But he said, listen, this is something else. If you're willing, see, the choice is yours. Amen. The choice is yours. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But look what he says, what's going to happen if they don't. If they choose another direction, instead of eating the good of the land, the land, God said, you'll be eaten. Yes. Wow. 
Now, I don't know about you, but instead of you know, being eaten, I like to eat. Amen. And you can tell. You can tell. How many of you like to eat? I know what I said. I think I said it. He's in the church tonight, right there. See, he's shaking his head, yes. And I said, I said, I like to eat. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. I like to eat too. Andrew likes to eat. You can tell since he got married. <laughs> <laughs> I told him the day he keeps going, he's going to look like his father in law. How many like to eat? Well, the choice is yours. Either eat or be eaten. How many y'all want to eat? Yeah, I said, I said, eat. A lot better to eat than to be eaten. The choice is yours. The choice is mine. Stop it. Resist it. Rebel it. Against God. I repent. Be cleansed. Be purified. Obey God. And what's that promise can place your life? Eat or be eaten. Verse 20, but you refuse to rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. How is the faithful city become a heart? It is full of judgment, righteous logic in it. It used to be like this. Righteousness used to be in it. But now murderous. Because they're not what you used to be. Okay, so you keep reading that chapter, you'll get the gist of it. But I'm going to go on to chapter 2. Because God says, if you keep on persisting, living this way, when well, you're rejecting God, rebelling against God, Amen. Amen. You continue to want to go through the motions, but your life's full of sin. Amen. Amen. He said, you keep going down that path. He said, you don't have a very good future ahead of you. And I'm telling you in the Holy Ghost tonight. If we live like they did, we don't have a very good future ahead of us. And what God planned you to be when you were born into this planet, Hallelujah! you will miss it because of sin. I want to be what God created me to be. And I want you to be what God created me to be. God wants you to be what He created you to be, but you can miss the opportunity. You can miss what God wants to do in and through you. Amen, amen. You can. You listen. You are You are risking your future by your present rebellion. And so that's what chapter two, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four. He switches now from the historical events there back in the days around 740 B.C. right before the Assyrian captivity. He now shifts into the future time called the Day of the Lord. Wow. Amen. Now depending on where you're in the Bible, the last days mean something different. Mm -hmm. There's the last days of the Old Covenant. When Jesus Christ came in, he brought in the new age of the spirit, the new age called the Ecclesia. That's right. Amen. The new age of the spirit. But there's a last days, a last of the last days, if you want to take it that way. Amen. And that speaks of the future second coming of Jesus to the earth when he breaks into time, when he breaks into history, and he makes every day right. All right. Hallelujah. It's called the day of the Lord. And he said, I'm coming back. And when I come back, I'm going to make everything right. And if you're righteous and you're godly and you're holy, you look forward to the day of the Lord. Because if what else says to you, it's going to be blessing. To you it's light. But to the sinner, to the ungodly, it's darkness and it's wrath and it's judgment. Hallelujah. It depends on the choices you make. God's coming back. He's going to make it right. It's called the day of the Lord. Amen. 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 It won't be long. I believe
remember at the end of man's day, Jesus is to come back, set up his day. <clears throat> so chapter 2 talks about just like this time of judgment when eventually Assyria would come and Isaiah whatever was happening historically in that time when Isaiah was preaching these armies invading Israel and destroying them he said there's coming a time in the future that it's not just going to be on the nation of Israel it's going to affect the whole world Amen. Amen. and God breaks it in time and makes it all right Amen. Amen. so that not just the nation of Israel not just Judah who lives this kind of lifestyle but anybody in the world that lives this kind of lifestyle Amen. that he's preaching judgment he said, it's coming on the whole world. Yes. And so he begins to use that term, the day of the Lord in Isaiah chapter 2. But before he does, Amen. before he goes back to the time of judgment, he talks about this glorious time in the kingdom when Jesus comes back and sets up his kingdom, reign, and the righteous are flowing up into the holy mountain of God and worshiping God. Yes, Amen. 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 For the righteous, it's good news. Amen. The word that Isaiah, the son of Ammon, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, it shall come to pass in the last day that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established to the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and call nations. And all nations shall flow. And this is not just Israel, not just Judah, but all nations are seen here. Flowing up to the mountain of God. Yeah, God's hallelujah. presence is. Yes, hallelujah. See, He has come back. The day of the Lord, He has come back. He's spoke in the time. He said of His earthly kingdom. And now the nations, all the nations, are flowing up into the mountain of God to worship God there. Yes. Hallelujah. hallelujah. Flowing. How does water flow uphill? That's not natural. So what God is saying is that it's not going to be natural. It's going to be supernatural. Hallelujah. People going, flowing up to the mountain of God. Hallelujah. It goes contrary to your fallen nature, contrary to your common nature, contrary to your sinful nature, contrary to your own will. Supernaturally, you flow up unto God. Many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Hallelujah. He shall judge among the nations. Hallelujah. And shall give many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares. Amen. And their spears and bring us a time of peace. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Praise God. Praise God. So in the place of war, you're going to be fruit bearers. Hallelujah. In the place of war, there's going to be peace. Hallelujah. God's going to be back. He's broken in time. He's making it right. Peace is throughout the world. They were worshiping God. Amen. Laying down their weapons. Amen. It's coming, brothers. This is just coming. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Ooh. God's going to work it all out. Look at him and say, God's going to work it all out. He's going to break every time. He's going to make it all work out. He's going to worry about everything. God's going to make it right. But now he shifts back to judgment ground. So you hear that flash of lightning. That flash of the kingdom. He's like, flash of lightning. that hits the prophet. He looks beyond the church hedge. And then sent spiritually into the church hedge. Because you're already walking up backwards. Contrary to nature. Into the presence of God. The worship of God. His spirit and truth. Some of the spirits so spirit like But anyway. He goes all the way beyond the church hedge. All the way to the millennial kingdom. Thousand year reign of Christ. And sees what's going to be in that time. A flash of lightning. And then after that flash of lightning hits. He goes back in. And he begins to preach judgment again. Amen. For so, old house of Jacob, come ye, and let us walk in the light of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Get out of the darkness. Yes. Come back to the light. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. 
Therefore thou hast forsaken the, thy people, the house of Jacob, because they be replenished from the east, and are soothsayers like the Philistines, and they please themselves and the children of strangers. Their land also is full of silver and gold, neither is there any end of their treasures. Their land is also full of horses, neither is there any end of their chariots. Their land also is full of idols. They worship the, the works of their own hands, which their own fingers have made. The mean man, that means the poor man, bowed down, the great man, humbled himself before, therefore forgive them not. Enter into the rock and hide thee in the dust for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty. Amen. Hallelujah. Talks about the pride yeah. in men. Yeah. Gonna be humbled for the day of the Lord. So very quickly, and I don't have time to read all the verses, but he keeps prophesying, he prophesies, he prophesies about Lebanon. He talks about Lebanon. He talks about the mountains. He prophesies about Tarshish. Amen. Amen. We have time to read it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Tarshish in the ancient culture was that far away distant place that was further than you could possibly conceive in your mind. It was so far away. And so what God is saying through the prophet Isaiah, He said judgment's coming. It's going to go as far as you can possibly conceive. Wow. It'll be worldwide. Verse 18, the idols he shall utterly abolish. They shall go into the holes of the rocks and in the caves of the earth for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he arrived that to shake terribly the earth. That local judgment upon Israel and Judah is going to go flow all the way up Hallelujah. to the ends of the earth. Of the Hallelujah. Day of the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Verse 22, cease you from man whose breath is in his nostrils for wherein is he to be accounted of. You know what he's saying? Stop fearing people. Right. Fear God. Yes. He said, because all a man is, his life is the breath of his nostrils. Right. He, starts, he stops breathing, he dies. Right. But God is eternal. Right. Fear, fear the one that is eternal. Not the one that breathes, that dies. Right. Somebody shout praise the Lord. Shout Jesus. He's awesome. He's right. The fear of man is a snare. You are to fear God. Amen. Hallelujah. Cease you from men. Hallelujah. Who spread in his nostrils. There's some people that are more intimidated by people than they are fear God. They make men they're controlled by peer pressure. Amen. They're worried about their, what the employees are going to think, what students around them are going to think. They're worried about what the people in the church are going to think. No, you fear God. Amen. You stop worrying about it. Yes. Stop being intimidated yes. by people. Yes. Yes. Brother Dyson can say this my mentor. He can say this. He said, I used to fear people. God delivered me from Amen. the fear of people. Amen. He said, I'm not intimidated by Thank people. Say praise God. Praise you either fear God or you fear people. Right. You fear people, you're trying to fit into their sack. Right. You're trying to live like they want you to live. Right. Right. And right. you fear God. Right. Say praise the Lord. Praise, praise the Lord. Lord. Amen. Chapter 3, very quickly. Amen. Now I'm going to that verse in chapter 6. I gotta go, I gotta preach it before I get there though. <laughs> chapter 3 for behold the Lord. The Lord of hosts did take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay, the staff, the whole stay of bread, and the whole stay of water, the mighty man, the man of war, the judge, the prophet, the prudent, and the ancient, the captain of fifty, the honorable man, the counselor, the cunning officer, the eloquent orator, and I will... <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Amen. What God said, there's going to come. I'm going to take it all away. Hallelujah! I'm going to take it all away. Yeah, amen. That's right. And ultimately, he said, I'm going to take away the whole staff of bread. He said, famine's coming. Right, right, amen. Amen. Right. He didn't just say I'm going to take away bread. I want you to see this. He doesn't just say he's going to take away bread. Right. He's going to take away the whole state of bread. Amen. Amen. Which means wholeness. Wow. Amen. 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 That's sad. Yes. Because we need <coughs> the eloquent orator. Yes. Yes. We need the prophets. Right. 
We need the priest. We need the agents. We need the judges. We need the mighty men. That's what it's coming down, though, because of the sin of the people. He's not going to take that. Amen. Wait. Amen. And when he does, what's going to happen? Something is going to fill the vacuum. Right. That's right. You know what's going to fill the vacuum? Children. Wow. wow. Children. He's I'll give you children to be their princes, and they shall rule over them. Wow. Amen. Are you here? Yes, sir. Yeah. You've got children calling the shots. You've got children telling the adult what to do. Are you kidding me? Whatever you do, parent, you do not set aside your authority. Don't try to... Now, you, you love your children, I get that, but don't try to be a friend to them because in order to be a friend to them, you're going to have to relinquish your position of authority. That means they'll start telling you where they want to go, what they want to do, what they like and what they don't like, and you'll listen to them. Have you lost your mind? You are perverting them. Yes. You will destroy them. Amen. Because they will know I run this house. Yeah. Amen. My mother and my daddy do what I tell them to do. Amen. You lost your mind? Yes, sir. That is a judgment from God Almighty. Amen. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Say praise the Lord. Now, I always try to be good to my kids. Always. But not one time did I ever set aside my authority. Right, right. Be one of the boys. Right, right. Be one of the, one of the gang. No, no, no. Because that's not biblical. Amen. Say, praise the Lord. But God said there's coming a time when these other things are removed. Now the children are going to call the shots. The people shall, shall be oppressed, and every one by another, and every one by the name of the child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient and the base, against the honorable. Look at that rebellion, man. They don't stand up and respect those that should be respected and those that should be honored because they weren't taught to. They taught the parent to bow to them. Amen. The parent didn't teach the child how to respect, so they don't respect. You got to teach them. If you don't teach them, they won't. They won't obey. If, the, if they won't obey you, they're not going to obey, the, obey a pastor. And they won't obey a pastor. They're not going to obey God. You have to teach them to obey. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. people, man. Right. Let them have whatever they want. No, this. Okay. No, you. Yeah. Right. I love you, but not in this house. Right. Yeah. yeah. I love you, but not in this house. Right. You go this lifestyle. Come on, Amen. 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 And it's perverted. Bad enough. We part ways. Amen. We part ways. And I won't give any of your intimidation or your manipulation. See, and, and, and what happened, brothers and sisters, this was what they were doing when they were going to church. The people. When they would go to church and they would go all through these outward emotions and outward outward demonstrations and sacrifices and the incense, they were doing all of that to manipulate God. Yeah, yeah. Amen, amen. Right. It wasn't because they had a desire to worship God the way God called them to worship Him. They did all of these things before the church to so try to manipulate Him. God said, away with that. And so now the spirit, that spirit is cut down into the, you know, headship. There's no headship, so now we got children. And they're manipulating the parents. Are you kidding me? Let God arise. Their 
Look at me and say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. See, I get what you're doing. You're trying to manipulate me. No. I see through you. And that's what they're trying to do to God. So I was going to be manifested in the home. Where's the mighty man? Let men be men. Let's be like men. For the mighty man, the man of war, the judge, the prophet, the prudent, the ancient. Captain Fiddy, the honorable man, the counselor, the cunning officer, the eloquent orator. And he said, in the place of that, I'll give you children to be your princes and babes. She'll rule over you. Babes. I don't have time to read all these verses, but you get the gist of the problem, don't you? Amen. This is a judgment on Judah, man. Say you to the righteous, verse 10. Then it shall be well with them, for they shall eat the fruit of their doing. See, once again, he goes back, flash the light, boom. He tells the righteous, it's going to be well with you. Don't worry about it. Thank you, Lord. Verse 12. <clears throat> but he goes on, he says, and that's a woe upon them. Verse 12, as for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. Women rule over them. Now, when you look at the word woman there, are we talking about literal women? It could be. It could be the woman is usurping the authority, her rightful place, usurping authority. Could be. But it also could be that the prophet is talking about men that are in leadership positions that are woman like. Women rule over them. We got too many men that are woman like. Say, so praise the Lord. That's a judgment from God Almighty. Okay, well, let's just talk about the real women then. Not the, not the woman like man. But let's talk about women. Are you women ready? Amen. God bless your little heart. You don't intimidate me. Praise the Lord. I'm shaking right now. Not really. I got this puppet to protect me. The prophet then he begins to deal with the women. With women, real women. This is real women. This is not, not men who think they're women. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hear it, you leaders of the United States of America. Hallelujah. Men who think they're women, you allow them in office. Right, right. The judgment from God. Amen. Hallelujah. Now he talks about women, but he talks about their pride. Right. Hallelujah. Amen. God don't like pride in you. Well, we'll talk about men in a minute, but you want to talk about the men, but I'm not there yet. And we, we're going to find them dead on the battlefield. So we'll get there in a minute. They're going to be dead in the battlefield. Hallelujah. What are you worried about, brother? Praise the Lord. They can talk, talk to the women first. What are you worried about? Hallelujah. We'll get to you in a minute. <laughs> Verse 16, though, he talks about the, the women, these women, not you, not you godly, precious, <laughs> submissive women. Yes. Is that better? Uh, How many godly, submissive women am I preaching to tonight? Y'all aren't godly and submissive and <laughs> sweet and gentle. And you, you call your husband's Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> With these bastards. 
Well, praise the Lord if there be any here tonight that's not that and you're this. God won't judge you. He said, well, the Lord said, because the daughters of Zion are haughty and walk with stretched forth necks as pride and wanton eyes walking and menacing as they go and making a tinkling with their feet. How do you make a tinkling with your feet? You got some kind of chain on so what he said, he shows this woman here. She's full of pride. She's got her neck stuck up, you know. She just man, she thinks he's around. Therefore, the Lord will smite with a scab the time of the head of the daughter of Zion. The Lord will discover their secret part. So what are you talking about? The pride that was in women. Pride that's in women. And he, so to take a long story short, he talks about how they were dressed, the apparel that they had on, and he said, you know what? He said, no, instead of all these wonderful garments and all these accessories that you have, God said, and, and the long, beautiful hair that you have, He said, you're going to be bald. Wow. And in the place of all these nice accessories and the nice clothing that you have, He said, you're going to be stripped naked. You're going to be bruised and beaten by the enemy. The Lord will discover your secret parts. He said in verse 18, I'm going to take it all away. You read it. I don't have time to read it tonight. All these accessories, all of these things that they look to, depend on. Verse 24, instead of the sweet smell, there shall be a stink. God, you see, I like this word, instead. It's over. It's over and over. Instead, instead, instead. Right. You put perfume on, it's supposed to smell pretty. It's right. supposed to smell good, right? Right. Right? Because you put perfume on to smell good. But God said, when you put it on, instead of smelling good, instead, it's going to stink. Wow. Instead of a girdle or rent, and instead of a well-set hair, baldness. Instead of a, a stomach shirt, that means a, whatever, something to keep your stomach in. You know, that, <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. A burden of sackcloth, the burden instead of beauty. But thy men shall fall by the sword. And, and now who is go to the men, brother? Praise the Lord. Now, hallelujah. Now listen, now I'm getting where you want to get. Now I'm getting where to the pride in women's going to be dealt with. Verse 25, Thy men shall fall by the sword, and thy mighty, men, mighty in war, and her days shall lament and mourn, and she being desolate shall sit upon the ground. Men is going to be death everywhere. Death. Dead in the battlefields. Brothers and sisters, I believe it's coming on this nation. Yes, yes. Yes, sir. Praise the Lord. And then another flash of light. Chapter 4. Looking over to the day, that future time. And that day seven women shall take hold of one man. Now, prophetically, that's the church. Because remember the seven churches in the book of Revelation? God said there will be seven women grab a hold of one man. That's a picture of the church. But it's a little fulfillment too. Seven women shall grab a hold of one man. Praise the Lord. That, well, they're desperate. Now, that's a spiritual application. Okay? <laughs> Seven women shall take hold of one man's hand. We will eat our own bread. We'll wear our own apparel. You don't have to provide for us or anything. We just want to be called by your name. Just marry me. If you marry me, I'll work. I'll take care of myself. I'll provide my own food. Hallelujah. My own apparel, just marry me. <laughs> Only let's be called by thy name and take away our approach. Yes. But ultimately, I'm just, I'm, you know, I'm just. But ultimately, that's people saying to the Lord, we are desperate for you, Lord. Hallelujah. In the day of the Lord, the time of judgment will come. We are desperate for you, Lord. We'll grab a hold of your hymn. 
Say praise God. Praise God. Amen. You know what he's saying? Let me show you who this is. These are people before he comes. Before he comes. Says, I believe in you. We'll provide our own food and our own apparel. Just let us be called by your name and remove the reproach from us. We believe in you before you come. How many of you have been called by the name of the Lord? Hallelujah! God has removed your reproach. He's the only one that can. And in that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful, be glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely. For then, them that are escaped of the Lord, it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion, he that remains in Jerusalem, shall be called holy, even every one that is written among the living in Jerusalem. When the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughter of Zion, and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof, by the spirit of judgment, by the spirit of burning. Now the Lord shall create upon every dwelling place a Mount Zion upon her ascendings a cloud of smoke by day, the shining of a flaming fire by night, for upon all the glory shall be a defense, and there shall be a tabernacle for a shadow in the daytime from the heat, and for a place of refuge for a cohort from the storm. That's the yes. wedding canopy. That is the hoopah. That's the wedding canopy for the church. Amen. This is what awaits the faithful bride of Jesus Christ. They're called by His name. The reproach is being removed. The walking in the light of the Lord. They're under the glory of God. The wedding hoopah, His pavilion, His tabernacle is there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In chapter 5, I don't have time to read all verses to you, but then he goes, the prophet begins to sing about a song about the vineyard. And he talks about this thing and he says, Vineyard is Israel. And he says, God took a piece of land. That's the land of Israel. He got rid of all the rocks out of it. He prepared it. And he planted the best vine, the nation of Israel, Judah, his people, yes. his covenant people. He planted them in the land of Israel. He put a fence around it to protect it. His protection was there. His provision was there. His vine was there. He gave it everything he needed. He took care of that vine. He sent the prophets to preach to that vine. He sent those prophets to remove the weeds. Out of that vineyard. He said a watchtower there. The watchtower of the word of God. To watch out any enemy that would come and try to destroy that vineyard. His protection was there. His provision was there. Everything that they needed was there. The Lord gave it all to them. Just like he did. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And then the Bible says. When it came time to go into his vineyard, he went into that vineyard and he was expecting good grapes. Right, amen, amen. But when he walked into that vineyard, instead of finding good grapes, he found sour grapes. That would be useless. And what does he mean by that? Well, he explains it. Verse 4 said, I found wild grapes. It's useless to me. Now I'll go to and I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof and it shall be eaten up and break down the wall thereof and it shall be trodden down. God said, I'm going to judge it. I'm going to destroy it. And I will let it waste. It shall not be pruned nor digged. And there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no more rain upon it. That's, listen brothers and sisters, left to yourself. Yes. Left to myself. Yes. This is what we are. Yes. For the vineyard of the Lord is the host, is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plan. And he looked for judgment, but behold oppression for righteousness, but behold a cry. That's why he had to judge it. There was an unrighteousness there. Wild grapes. Mm. 
pronounces woes upon them, one woe after another. Chapter 6, in closing. He asked that question, what more could I have done for my reader that I have not done? Right, right. What more could God do for you and I that He hasn't right, already done? Right, right, right. right. Is He finding good grace? Jesus. And I close with chapter 6. But before I do, I want to ask you a question. Why does God put chapter 6 here? After He's talked about the condition, spiritual condition, physical condition of Israel, he talks about what's going to happen all the way in the future if they continue in that particular path. Judgment in the day of the Lord. He encourages those that are faithful to Him. In those five chapters, they're all one unit. Why does He put chapter 6, the commission of Isaiah the prophet, after five chapters in Isaiah? Why does God talk about the call of the prophet in the sixth chapter instead of talking about his call in the first chapter? Because after five chapters of describing the condition of Israel and Judah, describing the church, describing the world, the judgment that's coming, and the judgment that is, and why? He says, I'm going to put chapter six here after the five because Isaiah is a parable and a type of the nation of Israel. Wow. Amen, 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 hallelujah, amen. hallelujah. So here he goes. Amen. In the year the king was I died, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne. His call and commission is not recorded until six chapters into the book. Ezekiel, his call and commission was the first chapter. This was the sixth chapter. And he said, in the year that King Uzziah died, that's, this king reigned for 52 years and he was a, a king that brought prosperity. Listen to me, you need this and I won't be much longer. He brought pros prosperity to the nation of Judah. Protection to the nation of Judah. It was such a prosperous time in the land when Isaiah's first commission, listen, you've got to remember we're not in chronological order here. Chapter 6 really should be at, at the beginning of Isaiah. Amen, amen. But it's a time of prosperity, kind of like the United States of America right now. Right. And that king was such an awesome ruler that even Assyria had not yet risen up as a threat against the nation of Israel. That man had prepared armaments for the nation. They were well protected. They were well provided for. They were thriving. They were, they were flourishing as a nation. Remember six is, a, is really before one. In all of that prosperity, brothers and sisters, that's when the nation of Israel turned away from God. And got into the condition that they were in for five chapters that we saw. That reaches all the way to your day. And then all of a sudden, this king that had ruled for 52 years, a qualified man, a man that was up to the task of being a king, brought them into times of prosperity and protection. He dies. And so Isaiah is called to be a prophet in connection to, and Uzziah is recorded in chapter 1, verse 1, as one of the four kings. 
He's called into his mission to preach when Uzziah dies, this awesome king. Amen, amen. Who will be adequate to take the place of this man? Who can bring prosperity and protection to this nation? Like this man. He's gone. You better pray for the president you have. Amen. You better pray for him. You better pray for your nation. Because in my spirit, what I feel a lot about what the United States is experiencing right now, the protection and provision that you have as a nation is because there is a man who fears God. Amen, right. amen, amen. And it's from the church. Yes. Amen, amen. Yes. You better pray. Amen. amen. Because these liberal politicians, the rulers of Sodom. Right, amen. Right. Hallelujah. But this king dies suddenly after 52 years of reign. And Isaiah... This, uh, this prophet Isaiah was in his court. Isaiah knew him. He's gone. Jesus. Who can take his place? Who is adequate to rule? Right, right, right. What are we going to do now? When this man dies, let me put you this way. There's uncertainty in Isaiah. There's uncertainty in the nation. What is going to happen now? I hear the Holy Ghost all over me. What will happen now? Uncertainty in the nation. Um, who's going to be adequate to take the place of this man? But the Bible says that when King Uzziah died, that Isaiah saw the Lord, the true King. I saw, in the year that King was I died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and His train filled the temple. Amen. Right now, we're in a, we're in a season as a nation. God has given us a season right now. Praise the Lord. You need to thank God for it. Hallelujah. And I thank God for it every day. Yes. We're in a season. But we need to keep our eyes on the true King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. Hallelujah. It's our Father in heaven, not our Father in Washington, D.C. So in times of prosperity or in times of uncertainty, what we have to understand is the true king is still ruling and reigning. Yes. And you and I have to keep our eyes. What is the answer? The answer to the nation when it's in prosperity. The answer to a nation when it's bashed away from God is to refocus on the true king of kings and Lord of lords. When I say Uzziah, Uzziah dies, the true king is seen. When your world falls apart. What are you going to do when your world falls apart? What about your economic world? You have to see the true king sitting on the throne. Focus on him. That's what me and my wife have to do right now. Focus on him. And not let anything distract us. Nothing distract us. Because so many things that come to me and my wife are nothing more than distractions right, right, right. from Him Amen. with whom we have to do. Amen. Hallelujah. And I will not be distracted by family, by friend, by anybody. I'm going to keep my eyes on the Lord. He's high and lifted up and His chain is still the Lord. If the nation's prospering, I'm going to keep my eyes on Him. If the church is prosperous, I'm going to keep my eyes on him. If the church is not doing good, I'm going to keep my eyes on him. If my world's coming apart, I'm going to keep my eyes on him. As the world turns, I'm going to keep my eyes on him. I refuse to.
you get distracted. Amen. And Lord, I explained the other day, Lord, all of these things that come have come to us are distractions. I will not be distracted. And so Isaiah, in a time of uncertainty, he had his eyes on King Uzziah. King Uzziah is gone. Now he's got to focus on the true king. And that's what God wanted him to do. I know I'm not the only one. There's people in this church I'm preaching to right here. You go through all kinds of things Saturday. The answer is get your eyes on the true king. As the world turns, he says upon the circle of the earth, get your eyes on him. Amen. 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 This world is about to lose its mind. I'm going to tell you. It's about to lose its mind. People are losing their mind right now. In the workplace. In the store place. In the church. Hallelujah. In the White House. You name every field, every area. People are losing their mind. And you haven't seen anything yet. This picture is so crazy. It's beyond your comprehension. You think we saw riots in the streets in the past. You haven't seen anything yet. As the world turns, as the world spins, you got to get your eyes on the Lord. Amen. Who you got your eyes on today? Amen. Amen. You got your eyes on a family member? You got your eyes on Trump? You got your eyes on Nancy? Pelosi? You got your eyes on Chuck Schumer? You got your eyes on him? You got your eyes on your husband? You better keep your eyes on your husband. You got your eyes on your wife? You got your eyes on them? As your world spins. Say praise the Lord. Tonight, what's going to get you through? Is knowing he's on the phone. He's on the phone tonight. I worship him. I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up his strength to the temple. And the temple was still in existence in that day. I don't think he looked up in heaven and saw all the way from heaven's throne, a big old road flowing all the way down from heaven down to the earth. No, no, he saw the Lord in between those cherubim, those cherubim, those seraphim in the holy temple. The holy of holies, the temple that was on the earth. He got a vision set. God sent in the holy of holies in that temple. And he saw his train flow. It was, it was bigger than the temple. It was bigger than the house. It was bigger than the church. He sat on that throne. He's got seven above him, cherubim beneath him. Living in activity and prayer and motion. And his train flows from his presence. From that throne in the temple. It flows into the holy place. It goes into the outer court. It's bigger than the temple. And this train, by the way, is not like a wedding garment. This is the garment, garments of a king that has won victories. They have won battles. You know what they would do when a king would win a victory? He would take a piece of the other king's garment, put it on his garment. What this is telling you is that your king, the one that's sitting on the throne, has never lost a battle. In his carnage, in his strength. It fills the temple. He has defeated every king, every principality, every power, every ruler that goes up. Is the trunk of a king who is victorious in battle. 
<laughs> he said, don't me preach. I know I'm being long-winded tonight, but you, you try to preach six chapters in a night and a half. Look at your neighbor say, he's never lost a battle. And why are you? His train fills the church. It's bigger than this church. It's bigger. And what he sees in that holy of holies, his presence of God. Jesus. John chapter 12 says, This is Jesus. Jesus. That's God. Wow. In his glory. Train flowing out of the temple. He looks up and he sees these seraphim. Hallelujah. And above that. stood the seraphim. Each of them had six wings or twain to cover his face. With twain he covered his feet. With twain he did fly. Seraph means fire. Ooh. The seraphim. He saw God. He saw the train. He saw the seraph. He saw the burning coals of fire. These creatures, these angelic creatures look like fire. Hallelujah. Fire burning fire. Seraph. People get in debates at that time. Yeah, are these the caravan transformed into look like fire? Or is this a separate group from the caravan? Wow. Personally, I believe that the seraphim are a separate group of angels. And they're above the throne. Wow. When you look at them, they look like fire. The caravan are at the feet of, of God. Amen. The seraphim above his head. Crying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Amen. But he sees the presence of God in his train from the temple, and he sees these seraphim in crying in holy acclamation. He's holy. They don't just say it one time, they say he's holy, holy, holy. It doesn't mean there's three of them. There's one place the Bible said that the prophet said, Oh, earth, earth, earth. That don't mean there's three earths. That's right. It's a Hebrew form of speech which means an emphasis on he's the holiest of all. He does his holy, but he's holy, holy, holy. Yeah. Prophet Isaiah sees his presence, sees the train filling the temple, sees these burning ones worshiping and moving. He said, two of the wings cover the feet, two of them cover the face, and with two they fly. So they're moving, they're motion, in motion. Amen. Amen. You see it in the spirit tonight? Do you see it in the spirit tonight? Do you see the Lord tonight on the throne? Do you see that holy acclamation of holy, holy, holy? Do you see the mighty movement of the burning, tiring wings? The temple, the, the, the veil of the temple. As they cry, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Do you see him on the throne today in the midst of your spinning world as the world turns out of control? Holy, holy, holy. Do you delight yourself in him tonight? He said it then. When they're shouting, holy, holy, holy. The praise begins to take place. Listen. If you can hear it in the spirit, like these burning, burning creatures. They're crying. Holy. 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 And as they cry holy, the other angelic hosts begin to cry. He's holy. He's holy. He's holy. Through the halls of heaven. They begin to say he's holy, holy, holy. And Isaiah's taking all of this in. The Bible said the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. You want something to move in your life? 
I don't care what it looks like. I don't care how bad it is or how good it is. If you want something to move in your life, cry holy, holy, holy. Look, look, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, He's holy, he's holy, he's holy. And when you do that, that's what something's going to happen. And those seven women come flying in like a 747. Hallelujah. Yes. You want something to move? Say, so nothing's happened in my life. Cry, holy, holy, holy. Give me this in my life, When he sees this vision of the presence of God and the Holy Ones, the bodyguard of God, crying holy in the train, filling the temple, the movement of the post. He said, Then, woe is me. Isaiah, you're a type of Israel. Amen, amen. Woe is me. He does not say, Blessed am I. Right, right. For I have seen the Lord, the Lord of hosts. He said, Woe is me. He says, I deserve to die. Why, prophet? Do you deserve to die? Why do you deserve the judgment of God? See, what is happening is here is that when he, see, when he sees his condition right. and he looks in the face of God, Say it. Yes. his condition is so unlike that. Right, he said, I deserve death. Right. Woe is me. What he's doing here is what the nation should do. It's what you should do. It's what the United States of America should do. It's what every person should do. Amen. Hallelujah. Is be a glimpse of the one that's on the throne and join in praise with the seraph of the burning ones. But when you see him, there'll be such a contradiction between your condition and him. Amen. Hallelujah. But you will say, I deserve to die. Morning. He breaks out into morning. That's why sometimes I, I wonder, can, when we come to the presence of God, we come in so nonchalantly and so you know, carefree. And, you know, right, 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 right. Listen, we can't see Him with our physical eyes. But this is, we're, we're coming to the throne. Who I am, who he is. Amen. He's so holy, holy, holy. He's the holiest one. He's separate and undefiled, separate from sinners. Holy means he's so pure. He can't even look upon sin. Woe is me, said the prophet. For I am undone. He said, I'm lost. I'm undone. I don't have it together. The prophet just said, Well, I'm going to act like I got it together. Come morning, church. I'm going to act like it. He said, Oh, no. Woe is me. I deserve warning. I deserve to get Because I don't have it together. I need to act like I have it together. Because this is the condition of the nation to which he preaches. He's just like them. We're just like you. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm undone because I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. What's he saying? I'm unclean. I need to be cleansed. The nation that I preach to needs to be cleansed. Yes. Amen. I tonight need to be cleansed. 
the church that I preach to tonight needs to be cleansed. The nation we preach to tonight needs to be cleansed. We have the judgments of God hanging over our head. Our nation has the judgments of God hanging over its head. We need to be cleansed. Oh, this me. I'm, un I'm undone. My lips are unclean. I don't want to be so people with lips. For mine eyes have seen the king Lord. Then flew one of the seraphs unto me. Amen. Had a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. Wow. The prophet Isaiah doesn't go to the altar where the fire is located in the sacrificial altar in the outer court. Right, right, right. One of the seraphim. Can you imagine? Ooh, like a 747. Got that coal of fire. Off that altar. Burning hot coals of fire. In the tongs. So, brothers and sisters, it was so hot the angel couldn't even handle it. Wow, wow, that's right. That's right. Amen. He had to have tongs from the altar. Yeah. He got the tongs from the altar. He got the burning coal of fire off the altar of sacrifice. And the Bible says he went and he placed that burning hot coal on the mouth of that prophet who said, I have unclean lips. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Now I want you to see something. Hallelujah. Amen. If you get a burning hot fiery coal placed on your unclean lips, that's going to be painful. Right, right, right. Amen. Amen. It was so hot the angel couldn't handle it, but he put it on the mouth of the prophet. Wow. 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 What would happen to you if somebody took a coal of fire and put it on your lips? It would burn your lips. Yes, sir. It would yes, be painful. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Verse 7, he laid upon my mouth and said, Lord, this has touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. The answer to the sobbing sinner. The answer to the sobbing sinner is to cry out for God to come and cleanse you of your unclean lips and my unclean lips. But the reason why it's a burning hot coal of fire is because God wants you to see that the nation is in such a state or such a condition that it's going to be painful for them to be cleansed. What they're going to have to go through before they will repent is going to be painful. Amen, amen. So Isaiah is after the first five chapters is because he's showing you a parable of the nation of Israel. They are unclean. They are unneed, undone. They are in need of the one on the throne to cleanse them. Amen, amen. But Isaiah is letting them know they can be cleansed. Amen. God wants to cleanse us. Amen. Amen. No. No. After he's cleansed, now he can go. He cannot go and preach to them until he first has the coal of fire placed upon his lips. Right, right, right. right. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I need my sin removed before I can come and preach to you. I'm not Isaiah, but every one of us tonight need the cleansing of God. Yeah. I, I don't, it doesn't matter how long you've been in the church. I've been in this land almost 40 years, but we haven't arrived yet. Yeah. we got to get rid of the pride, yeah. which says, I know better than God. I know how to do it better than God. Yeah. And so God will come and cleanse us with fire. When he comes, he cleanses the prophet with fire. Now the prophet, having been cleansed, is now able to go forth and fulfill his commission and call into the ministry. Amen, amen, amen. He begins to listen in. The prophet listens in to the courtroom of heaven. Wow, amen. And he overhears God talking. Yeah, amen, amen. 
And, and what is God talking there in that throne room? What is God saying? Yeah, yeah, amen. The prophet listens. I heard the voice of the Lord, the prophet said, saying, Whom shall I send? God tonight, if you were to really listen, and you are by the word of God, is saying, Who shall I send? What are you going to say? If you hear God tonight say, Who shall I send? If I hear God say, Who shall I send? Do I say, Send him? <laughs> right? That's the way most, most of us are. Right, that's most definitely. You hear God say, Who shall I send? Uh, send Pastor Carter. Right. What about you? Exactly. Say, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hey, when you really get cleansed, Come on. you get the sin removed out of your life, yes, Lord. Talk to us, God. Yes. then you'll be willing to go. Amen. It won't be send them, send Isaiah said, Here I am. Sin me. Don't you never say, here I am? Sin me. Did you mean that? God just hurt you. <laughs> you know what this is a picture of? A picture of Israel will be cleansed. The prophet will show us. And they will repent. And they will be purified. And they will become the nation that witnesses to all the nations of his glory. Read chapter 56 through chapter 66. They will say, here I am, said me. And he said, go and tell this people. So now I finally get to my message. Go and tell this people. Amen, What are you going to tell them, Isaiah? What's God's message to them, Isaiah? Hear you in me, but understand not. And see you in me, but perceive not. Make the hardest people fat. Make their ears heavy. Shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears. And understand with their heart and convert and be healed. Did you see that? God says to the prophet, you go and preach to them. But when you go and preach to them Isaiah, it's not going to get better, it's going to get worse. Amen, amen. Why would God send a prophet to preach a message to people that when he preaches that message to them will make them worse instead of better? What a disappointment for God to speak to this prophet and say, you go and preach. Make their ears heavy. Shut their eyes. Lest they see. What a disappointment. For the prophet to hear that when he goes and preaches, that the message that he preaches is gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna be worse than better right, for the people. Amen. The reason is what God is showing him is that in the condition that they're in, a temporary fix. What he's showing them is, God is showing them, he doesn't need them to, when they find out calamity's coming and judgment's coming, they say, oh, you know what? I better get right and, and you know, get right for a couple of days, but no transformation. Only worried about judgment, only worried about losing this or losing that. No true transformation in the life. Right. So God is going to use the prophet to preach to them to bring them to the end. Amen, amen. 
so that they can't just have a temporary quick fix. You know how it is. Some people go to church, they hear the word of God, and now you know, they're straight there for a few days. That's it. There's no transform life. There's no change in their heart. They just got a little bit concerned about what they might lose. God doesn't want that. Amen. Amen. So when this man comes and preaches, the message is true. Amen. The problem is not with the Word of God. The problem is with the people. Amen. What God is showing you is that their heart is so hard toward God that when the Word of God is preached, it makes it worse. It's possible for you to say no to God so many times and harm your heart to God so many times that when the Word of God goes forth and it's preached to you, you become worse instead of becoming better. That is an indictment against you. It's not Isaiah's fault. It's not God's fault. It's their fault. How many times have people come to hear the word of God and I'm not Isaiah, but they didn't get better. They got worse. Their ears got heavy. Their eyes couldn't see. Why? Because they allowed their heart to be hardened. Against the gospel. But God says, still go, still preach, still tell them, yes, they're going to get angry, yes, they're going to get mad, yes, they're going to harm your heart, yes, they're going to get worse, but you preach and you preach and you preach. And the prophet says, how long? And God says, until the judgment comes. You keep preaching, Isaiah. They're going to get worse. And there's going to come a time after closing their eyes so many times and closing their ears so many times, they're going to get to a place where they don't want to hear it anymore. Yes. And God said, then judgment's coming. Going from bad to worse. Amen. To the point at some point, if you're not a part of the remnant of God who says, I'll repent before my God, at some point you will say, I don't want to hear it anymore. That's good. Amen. Preach it. And when you get to that place, that's when judgment will fall. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Because then. Amen. You will no longer be able to hear. How many times the word of God's going forth? The preacher mean, meaning no offense. No offense. Then people get up and walk out the door. Right, right, right. Right, right. Every time they did, you know what's happening? God's allowing them to become harder and harder and harder. Right. Mm. Right. We've got to listen when God brings the word. When He speaks to us, we better be ready to receive with meekness the right. grafted word which is able to save our souls. Amen. <laughs> Stay humble before. Keep yourself humble under the mighty hand of God. Because <coughs> God's trying to save you, trying to reach you, trying to get you to get back on fire, trying to get you to turn out the hill, trying to get you to keep coming. Don't get offended. Don't get mad. Don't get angry. Don't get from God. Run to God. To God. Every time you say no to God, shut your heart to God. Yeah. God said, one more message for you, one more, one more. And you get worse and worse and worse. Until finally you say, I don't want to hear it no more. God says, when they get tired of hearing it, when they don't want to hear it no more, that's when the judgment's coming. Yes, shut up. Yes. It's an out of the Lord, how long? And he answered. 
until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, the house without man, and the land be utterly desolate. That's all we have to preach. Woo! Hallelujah. And the Lord hath removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. Verse 13. <clears throat> but the good news. Yes. But in it shall be a tenth. He said there's going to be a remnant. He said there's going to be one tenth. Yeah. Only one tenth. They're not going to be like these people who got worse by preaching. One tenth will say yes to the Lord. One tenth will repent. One, one tenth will say, I will follow you, Lord. One tenth will be in a relationship with God. One tenth will be true Christians. The wow. remnant. One tenth it shall return and shall be eaten. And as a teal tree and as an oak whose substance is in them when they cast their leaves. He said, this is what it's like. He said, there's going to be a tenth of them that make it, a tenth of them, a remnant, a tenth that's going to make it back. And he said, it's like a tree that's being cut down. The battle's taking place, and the tree got cut down, it fell down. Wow, wow. Judgment came. Wow. But he said, the prophet said, I looked up, and I saw a stump. Amen. And that stump was the holy seed. The stump is the holy seed. Amen. What are you saying, Isaiah? After judgment comes, there's going to be a remnant of people who are the holy seed. Amen. These are the ones that will serve God. These are the ones that will follow the Lord whether so wherever He goes. These are the ones that will obey His covenant. These are the ones that will walk holy before Amen. God. Amen. It's a stump. Of the Holy Seed. Wow. What God is saying is just like a stump of a tree that's left. The possibility of new life is there. Wow. Amen. He will pick it up in Isaiah chapter 11. He'll talk about a root out of dry ground. Thank you, Lord. A root of Jesse coming up out of a dry ground. Life from the dead. Amen. The says, to those who would not become hardened and become worse as they heard the word but responded to that word and received that word. There will be a small group that's like a stump that doesn't look like much left. But he said from that stump life will come. Amen. It's called the Holy Seed. And as we go through the word of God this man that was cleansed now conditioned we go through the prophet Isaiah, you will see this statement recorded over and over and over in the prophet of the Lord, the Holy Seed of Israel. Amen, amen. Would you stand? Ultimately from Israel will spring Jesus, who will come and bring salvation. God is saying, through this prophet. He's saying they're in such bad shape. They don't recognize the bad condition that they're in. They need help. But God said, I'm going to give them help. I'm going to send them a prophet. And through that prophet, many will become worse because they will harden their heart. But there will be some that will hear and respond. And life will come from them. Not the stump of a tree. They are the holy seed. They will flourish. They will be blessed by God. They will grow up as the calves in the stall, worshiping Him. They will cry to Him for cleansing. Amen. Amen. There will be men and women of integrity, not perfect but blameless. Which means if they sin, they will repent Amen. and confess their sin. Amen. 
and be cleansed and walk with the Lord and respond to His Word. Thus saith the Lord through the prophet Isaiah. Let's pray. Father, we thank You tonight for Your awesome Word. Thank You for Your awesome presence in this house. I pray for myself. Cleanse me with Your precious blood. Wash me, purify me. I'm not perfect, but I seek to be blameless, a man of integrity. I confess my sin before you tonight, Lord. But for this church, God, bring us to a place where we are the holy seed, the stuff that life can come out. That which remains, the tree has been cut. Let us flourish, let us thrive in you, Father. Let us receive your word. Obey it. Walk in submission and humility. Abandon our pride as men and women. Pray for this church tonight. You continue to bring us to an understanding as we stand in your holy presence and worship you tonight in spirit and in truth. We look beyond this present world. And everything that's happening, one true king sits upon the throne. And we cry, Holy, 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 unto you. Thank you for your mercy and your grace upon us. We're all undone and unclean. Thank you tonight for cleansing us by your blood. You save us by your power, your spirit, by your word. Everybody say in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Tonight, please close your eyes and bow your heads. Lift your hands to heaven. Lift your hands to God. And I speak to you tonight that you can be one that chooses the right path. Or you are one here tonight who will once again harden your heart until finally you refuse to hear and the judgment will come. You will grow worse and worse instead of better. Tonight you stand in the holy presence of God and you can make the choice just as the prophet, just as the people of Judah. To this world tonight, your king should be Jesus Christ. You should abandon your sin. You should turn to God with all of your heart. You should repent of your sin, be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and be filled with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking with other tongues. And by the power of His Spirit, walk in holiness before Him. Jesus' name. Jesus. Tonight, would you lift your hands and cry, Holy, holy, holy unto the Lord. Holy, 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 holy. Desire, I desire, I desire, hold this on you. I desire to be holy. sin you are involved with tonight but his offer tonight is to forgive he desires to cleanse you he desires that your life be transformed be renewed you need to get back to God you need to get back to God
and be changed internally. Stop pointing the finger, blaming everybody else. Look to God. And He'll help you. Deliver you. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'm thankful tonight for God's grace and mercy in my life. The power of salvation that is effectual in my life. It's my personal testimony. If you, and you don't need to, but if you only knew how bad it can get in your family without righteousness and wholeness and purity and walking with God, if you only knew how bad it could get, you don't need to. Turn to God with all your heart and live for Him. Serve Him. Amen? Because if you don't, you'll see how bad it can get. But that's not what God wants for you. God wants you to flourish. Amen. Bless your life. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Might as well. And I need God just like you do. Right? Praise the Lord. Amen. Lord, we thank you one more time. In the mighty name of Jesus. We give you all the glory and praise. Thank you for your word, God, tonight. Turn your will. Then what you told me to do. So may you be glorified and you be honored tonight by your own word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed in the name of the Lord. Look at your neighbor and tell them that you love him.